Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast. Hi, Tammy, are we on? We are live, Bobby. Have a wonderful Great. webcast. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Today's webcast brought to you by Fire Engineering and Target Solutions. What an amazing webcast this is going to be. We've got one of our favorite people, longtime presenter at FDIC, noted author, member of one of our advisory boards, and an all-around great guy who's going to be entertaining you today and educating you today. One of the best instructors I've ever run across. So what an amazing day we're going to have here. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the folks that are going to be bringing this webcast, Drills You Won't Find in the Books. We've got Target Solutions sponsoring us today. And Target Solutions is one of the most cutting-edge software applications you can possibly have for online training, world-class customer service. They were founded in 1999 when the Internet was just taken off. And today, over 2,000 organizations use Target Solutions' innovative technology to solve their training challenges. I'll tell you what, Target Solutions has more than 258 hours, 250 hours of fire and EMS training, education, as well as the right kind of software that you need to track your ISO hours and all your other training compliance issues. It's an amazing company. They've, they've, they're just one of the most fantastic groups you can have. They're partnered up with our good friends from CenterLearn. And I'll tell you what, you can't go wrong. After we get done with this webcast, if you're looking for a place to find good training and drills and things that you can use every day, go to targetsolutions.com. I guarantee it will be worth your time, and they're absolutely wonderful people. We've known them since they began, and it's a wonderful, wonderful corporation. So let me give you a little bit of housekeeping stuff before we begin. If, if you're looking at your console, there's a bunch of widgets you can use. You have to ask a question during the webcast. If you click on that widget, you will submit your questions. We're going to answer those questions at the end of the webcast. So if you put something in there, it may get answered and we'll delete it. Otherwise, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. The ones we can't get to, we'll send to Raul, and he'll post them up on fireengineering.com. You can expand the slide area by clicking on the magazine icon at the top right of the slide area and then drag or by dragging the bottom right corner to enlarge. If you have any technical difficulty during this webcast, just click on that help widget. We've got one of our great technicians, Tammy, standing by, and she'll try to answer it for you and give you the help that you need so that you can watch the show correctly. For your convenience, the presentation is going to be available on demand within 24 hours of this live webcast, and we'll send you an email to remind you of all that good stuff. So if you want to use this at your company drill on an, on an opposite shift or, or in your volunteer job or even on your, your paid job uh, on, on another day just to follow up with some good training, it will be there for you to use absolutely free. Let me tell you a little bit about my good buddy, Raul Angelo. He, aside from being a great friend, he's a veteran of the Seattle, Washington Fire Department with more than 30 years of fire service experience. He's currently the captain on Ladder 6. He's been a member of the Fire Apparatus and Emergency Equipment Advisory Board, and he's the tool tech uh, columnist that you read every month. He lectures on fire service leadership, company officer development, fire ground strategy, and accountability throughout the United States. His classes at FDIC are always packed, and he does a great class at FDIC on rules, that drills you're not going to find in the books, you got to go see it in 2016. He's going to be there, and you're going to absolutely enjoy it. So without any further ado, it gives me incredible pleasure to introduce to you one of the fire service icons and a great guy, Captain Raul Angulo. I got it right, Raul. You got it. You did get it right, Bob. Thank you. And uh, You got it, buddy. And Tammy, I'm just having trouble getting this thing to advance. It seems like I'm locked up. I'm going to try one yeah, more time me too, here. Tammy. Are you locked up too, Bob? Yeah, I sure was. Let me see if I can help you, buddy. Where, where is Tammy when we need her? Slide, no, she's here. Give us slide three, Tammy. Okay, I'm showing the live button now. There you go, buddy. Sorry, guys. We're having a little technical oh, difficulty oh, okay, here. Okay, we got it. Okay, so this should go pretty quick. Um, this is drills you're not going to find in the book. And... Uh, Real briefly, um, these are drills that I've come up with over my 37-year career in the fire service, 35 with Seattle, 37 total. And what they are is they're out-of-the-box drills just teaching firefighters, company officers how to think. So let's look at the first slide here, dreading the drill. And I asked the question, I said, what are some of the things that prohibit or stumbling blocks to having an officer run uh, a really good effective drill. And usually they fall into these categories. 
uh, guys don't like looking stupid or they're afraid of exposing the deficiencies that they should know and don't. Uh, they've been teased in the past. They don't want to get teased. They don't want to look bad in front of the chief or sometimes uh, officers uh, look at this as an opportunity to show how smart they are at the expense of the firefighters. And then finally, and we all know that sometimes they're just a little lazy and, and it's not fun. So those are consistent answers that I've had over the classes. One of the things I do, and we all like goofing off at the fire station, and hazing has become a popular topic in the fire service, and it's getting restricted more and more, but uh, don't really associate training with hazing, because that, that sets in negative and um, starts in planning some of those bullet points that we saw in the slide before. So drilling and training should never be connected with hazing for the new firefighters. And no, sh nor should it be with discipline. You know, drilling and training is not a punishment. I just had a conversation with a chief officer, national chief officer, last shift, who said, "Well, you know, you can always drill him, and and he does look at this as a form of discipline, and it probably is effective. I'm not saying that it isn't. Guys have too much time on their hands to go and and drill him. But for me, as a company officer, you want to build that relationship that they're looking to you as a mentor, as an instructor, that you're giving them." your best information. You're not holding anything back for punishment in the future. You're giving them all the tools that they need to be the best that they can on the fire ground and to be as safe as they can on the fire ground. So I don't like to associate drilling with discipline. One of the things I remind people is follow your SOPs, uh, follow your department training guides. But notice training guidelines are usually written as that, guidelines. They're giving you the direction. They're not cast in stone, and we can't write every situation in the book. Follow your safety and rules, your safety rules and regulations, and follow your union contracts because these are all going to be negatives that uh, can jam you up. For example, if, if you're not supposed to drill on Sundays or on holidays, this isn't the time because it's a slow day to say, hey, we're going to have a drill. So, so keep those uh, deals and parameters. Uh, where they belong and it will keep you safe and, and guys won't resist your uh, instruction. So be creative. A lot of the drills that you're going to see are uh, drills that aren't in the books. They're maybe in old books, drills that have been out of publication in, for 50 years, some of them, and they're not readily available to firefighters. A lot of them I just came up with myself. But all of them pretty much are based on close calls or uh, actual case studies and um, line of duty deaths, line of duty injuries, and if you tie them to an event that happened, and we'll talk about that, it gives them legitimacy and credibility, and that's key, because it already happened. And now living in a post-9-11 world in the fire service, there's no, there's no more regular stuff. I mean, it's all over the map on, on what can happen and events that we can get called to. So, but the bottom line is, is after you've done your firefighter one and two skills, what are you going to do when it's 2 o'clock in the morning near the company office? Bottom line, you know what? It's your call. It's your call. You're not going to be able to go back and reference the training guide. You're not going to be able to call your buddy or your mentor or your chief from another department. You have to come up with a plan, and it's your call as the first in officer. And so these drills are designed to make you and your people think, to use your tools. Above all, be safe. Don't get anybody hurt training. Try and foresee and forecast any predictable event. So let's, oh, i got to mention here, Battalion uh, Chief Mike Walker was one of the keynotes at uh, FDXC a couple of years ago, and he introduced the fireman standard, which is his quote, and I love that. Being satisfied with minimal effort isn't enough. In fact, a minimum is just one small step above inadequate. I found that quote extremely uh, inspiring. So, as I go through the class, uh, I start off small. You don't have to start out with the hard drills. You want to build up if you're going to start becoming a little innovative and out of the box. So I start with apparatus drills. And if you have a spare apparatus, that is the, the best one to kind of sabotage, so to say, uh, you know, loosen couplings, loosen nozzles, because it's not your first line rig. But, uh, you know, you can use that spare apparatus to, to bring your guys out and say, okay, I want you to do a complete rig check and uh, use that spare apparatus as your teaching point. One of the drills that I do is a chainsaw drill. And uh, a lot of firefighters, they'll come to work and they'll see okay, nozzles there, hoses there, 
chainsaw is there. They might check the fuel level. But do you teach them to check all the little things on the saw, like proper chain tension? I've come to work and see chains that are too tight and too loose. I've taken out two of our training saws, which are not our first-line saws, put them side by side, and I'll have the new guy go, okay, are these saws ready to go? Is there anything wrong with these saws? With these saws, which one is uh, assembled incorrectly? And have them look at it and look at it. What you'll see is that you can put the chain on backwards. And I've had firefighters catch this, but I've also had firefighters not catch this. So if you look closely at the carbide piece, and I ask the question, is this chain on properly? Answer, no, the teeth are backwards. And do they even know which direction the chain spins? This is all having them become experts on their equipment. And then how about this saw? And if you look closely, this one is assembled correctly. I have them draw their equipment. And this is just a drill you can do at the kitchen table and hand out blank sheets of paper and say, okay, draw me the pump panel. They should, be, they should know their equipment so well that they can draw it. And there's different versions. But how detailed can they get? I've had firefighters be extremely detailed. I've had firefighters, uh, this one has uh, five discharge handles on the right-hand side. I've had some with three. I've had some firefighters be so detailed that below the gauges they have the calibration knob. Um, you know, there's a throttle in the right place, the relief valve. And you can do this drill right there at the kitchen table. And they really do get into it. You'll see a common theme throughout this class that you develop a sense of friendly competition. Now, this firefighter here on the right, this guy is not the most motivated guy. Won't give you his name, but he's a challenge. And uh, he's even did self-proclaimed, I am a lazy guy. But even he got into this drill. I was surprised. I was taking the picture. I said, hey, I need some cooperation. And this guy got into the drill. And they started comparing uh, diagrams, and then they went to the side panel. And this, you know, this photo op, so to, so to say, turned into an actual, you know, an hour and a half drill as they were drawing equipment. So it's just an easy, quick drill. And uh, you can use that on a variety of pieces of equipment. And I'll show you that here. Portable radio drills is an extremely important drill because that is our lifeline. That is our communication. Uh, if we get in trouble, we need to know that piece of equipment so well that can you draw it? You might have to maneuver it and, and play with it in the dark and operate it in, in uh, zero visibility. But if you can draw your radio, it doesn't matter what position you're in or you find yourself or you find the radio and you'll be able to maneuver and accomplish the things that you need to accomplish. So I have you guys draw the radio. That's just not a convenience tool. That's our lifeline. That's our call for help. Draw the top of the radio. These are the buttons. It's a very detailed drawing here that one firefighter did. So he knows his radio well. Radio checks. How often do you do that? Every day, once a week? But do you grab the radio and say, portable me to portable you, loud and clear? But this isn't how we operate on the fire ground. Now, you don't have to check your radio every day like this, but try it with full gear. Now, check the radio. A lot more challenging. Can they activate their emergency button with gloves on? They're going to do it like that in a real event. A lot of firefighters haven't even tried to do this. They do it with hands, or we'll do it in, in, the, in the work uniform and talk about it, but we don't actually fire the button very often. You can do that with the radio off, or you can actually uh, call the dispatch center and say we're going to do some emergency button drills and, and actually set out some time for that. You can teach them that if you have a flexible antenna, this is a skill that they can use, and they can actually fold over the antenna and fire the button because the finger in the gloved hand is too thick. So use the antenna, bend it over, and the antenna fits right on a lot of these buttons. There's a lot of models out there that happens to be a, a Motorola model. But after they learn it with their hands, then they practice it with gloves on. A lot more challenging. But if they learn the technique, they do get very good at this. Channel checks. I used to have my firefighters change the channel, and I'd go change to channel 7, and they'd have to count the clicks or listen to the clicks. 
Now, Seattle just changed their model over. Now we actually have an automated voice that when you change a channel, it goes channel 7, channel 8, channel 1, and it ruined my whole drill. <laughs> but the point is there's still a lot of radios out there, and I, I asked this in the last FDIC. There's a lot of radios that don't have that uh, automated voice, and so you still have to learn. And how do you know if you're right, on the right channel or if you accidentally switched? And when we lost Lieutenant Matt Johnson at the Blackstock fire, he was on channel two when the fire was on channel one. Okay, He never realized something happened during that event where he switched channels and he wasn't aware of it. And this is probably not the first time that this has happened. So teach your people how to count and feel the clicks with their glove hand that they can go to any channel on that radio, one to 16, by clicking and counting. And that's a drill you can do right there in the firehouse. Teach them how to speak. Keep your microphone one to two inches away. Practice like this. And then you practice with your gear on. A lot of the problems that we have uh, is we don't have drills like this, and so you'll get communication. <laughs> you can't hear what it is, and the IC says what? Engine 8, repeat. And what do they typically do? They say the same thing, only louder. So teach them the skills to speak when they're covered with SCBA. They need to talk loud, clear, don't shout, and find where's that sweet spot for them. These are all things that come up by the IAFC to establish better communication. Shield the mic, cover the mic, move away from noise. If your past device is operating and you can still turn it off to give uh, information and you're able to do that, teach them how to cover or turn off their past device give the Mayday information that you need to get to the IC and to the Rapid Intervention Group, and then turn your past device back on. But these are all skill sets that we need to teach, and it's all about radio communication. Turning away from loud noises on the fire ground, chainsaws, sirens, pump pounds. Just look and see how they carry their mic. How do they carry their microphone on their bunking gear? I went around the country and took some shots just to see how firefighters carry their mic. And look at where this guy carries it. And so I asked the question, why do you think he carries it here? And the answer is, I mean, because if my mic is that low, I can't hear. But why did he keep it there? Answer, because that's where the manufacturer put the tab. And so he thinks that's where the radio goes. Well, if that's not where you want it, move it to where you want it. I just went around Boston and took some pictures of the guys in Boston. Same type of deal. This one's closer to the ear and to the head, but the reason why that firefighter clips it there is because that's where the tab is on the uh, from the manufacturer, from the PPE manufacturer. Well, that's fine if they just clip it there, but it better be secured. In this prop that you see, this is a, a teeter-totter collapsing the firefighter into a hole. If that microphone is not properly secured, they will lose it. I mean, these falls, you can see that there's a lot of momentum when these firefighters fall in these collapse props. And this one here, this firefighter starts grabbing his chin strap. He's grabbing his SCBA strap because he lost his microphone because it was simply clipped into the tab. And so when he goes to, to uh, retrieve it, it's not where he thinks it is. And so you teach him, well, how do you get out of that? Now he's trying to entangle it. And I'll show you how in a bit. So there's pieces of equipment out there. This one in particular, um, I think, is a real lifesaver because it is a retractable cord. I got one of these uh, gear keepers because I found, when I was inside giving reports, that I had to pull my microphone off the tab. That's how I used to carry it. And then I couldn't put it back on without without using two hands. So I either let go of the tool or I let go of the hose line. And I realized there's got to be a better way to do this. And I found these retractable cord systems are the best way to go. I asked firefighters, I said, who carries their radio like this on the uh, bandolier belt? And a lot of them do. But I asked the question, well, when you're on a, if you're on a truck company, not only do you have your SCBA waist strap, but you also have a ladder belt. You've got two belts now that are around your waist and your radio is below that. And how are you supposed to change channels 
or call for help? How do you fire your emergency button when it's under all your gear? And there's been some discussion on that. Now, if you're good at it and you practice like that, well, that's how you want to carry it, that's fine. But my point is it sets up a lot of obstacles for that radio when you need to call for help. So me personally, I do not recommend or I would question, is this the best way we can actually carry the radio? A lot of firefighters strap that cord around the back of their neck. Well, when you're caught in a flashover, what's your natural response? Belly up or belly down? Answer belly down. You're going to protect the most important parts of your body. But what's your highest area that's exposed to the heat? And that's your back. Well, those cords are only rated for 300 degrees or, or whatever it is. I mean, they're not designed to be fireproof. And so they'll burn off if you're in a high thermal event. And we've had this happen. There are case studies where you lose your, your radio cord. So you want to protect that. So I would keep that on your front part of the person because if you're laying down, then your radio, which is, again, your communication and lifeline, is protected by your body. You want that radio to operate when you're in trouble. So we combine that with the fence drill. There's a lot of versions of the fence drill, and I tend to blindfold my guys. There's a lot of ways to blindfold, but the quickest, simplest way is just to turn their hood around, and that's just to make it a little bit challenging. And here you see a firefighter that is uh, following a lead line on a search, and all of a sudden there's a collapse. Now, the first time I went through this, I had never been in a collapse prop. I had never been pinned before. I mean, it wasn't until I was a captain that I went through a drill where I felt, felt the sensation of being pinned with weight. And so you need to create this sensation for your firefighters. And this is one way of doing it. It doesn't hurt them, but they're trapped. They cannot move. Yeah, I'm going to a white blank here, Tammy. Yeah. Bobby, you there? Hi, I'm here. I'm right I'm here, little brother. Okay, I just uh, with a guy under I got chain 50, link. Right, I got 54. Oh, yeah, added weight restricts breathing. Looks good. Okay. Okay, so we're 54. You want me to advance for you, buddy? Yeah, go ahead, and uh, I'm not seeing it, but I, I can continue going on. Okay, so okay, anyway. I'll advance um, them. Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, so when you uh, lay the firefighter, or he's pinned by the fence, then have your other firefighter lay on top of him and uh, give them that sensation that they can't breathe. They need to feel that weight on them. If you've never felt that, it's very, very scary. Okay, next slide. You have them try and call a mayday, use the right hand. We're on slide 56, yeah. Raul. Use the right hand. Okay, so here we go. So uh, we created the sensation and we added the weight restrictions. If a uh, firefighter's laying on that guy, it's going to restrict his breathing. And again, you don't want to hurt them if they call, you know, uncle or, or get off, get off. But they need to feel that when they get hit by a roof or a wall, there's no mercy there. That wall is not going to get off you because you can't breathe. So now, if you're pinned, look at uh, the slide there that says try to call a mayday. Okay? If he's right-handed, his right hand is down. He can't move. So now he has to practice with his left hand. Do you teach your firefighters how to practice with the right and left hand? So I do. You have to teach them how to use the right hand. As you can see in that slide, it says use the right hand. And then practice to use the left hand. And you'll click it a second time, the radio will point to the radio pocket. So now if they lose their microphone, if you look carefully, the microphone on this particular slide is on the right side of the firefighter's chest. But if his hand's pinned and he can't reach it for some reason, you can reach your radio. You don't need to pull it out of the pocket. You can key the radio right through the pocket and then give your mayday information. Great. So next slide. Next slide is calling the mayday. So I helped write this uh, curriculum with Dr. Bruce Clark, and we use Lunar. I know the uh, IAFF is using who, what, when, where, how. It doesn't really matter which acronym you use, but these, this is the information that you need to teach firefighters to 
convey when they call for a mayday. If you listen to some of the mayday traffic, it's a very quick mayday, 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 and, and then it's hitting this on whether they're getting all this information. But we need their location, their unit, their name, their air, their air, how much air they have left, their assignment, and what resources do they need. Are they trapped, pinned, burned underwater, right? If you go to the next slide, it says the typical accountability system. Okay, so here you got rescue one, engine one, and ladder one. The locations are floor two, floor three, and the roof. On the next slide, you have the lunar, and this is all part of the drill that you can incorporate into your radio training and see the significance of lunar. If you take any component of lunar, you can tie it to the accountability system that you use, whether tags or passports, and be able to locate that person. For example, if all you get is uh, mayday, 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 uh, this is rescue one, and that's all you hear, then you know that whatever's happening is on floor two. Now you call them on you call them on the radio. If the captain Captain Larson acknowledge the radio from the IC, and all Tucker acknowledges, and Ronald acknowledges, then Trotter is your guy. If all you get is mayday, 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 I'm out of air then who is it? Well, I don't know, but who would run out of air first? Look at the bottom there, fire attack and search and rescue. Fire attack went in at 433 versus 437. It's going to be somebody on engine one probably. So call through the process of elimination. Or maybe, maybe, maybe I was, I was doing search and rescue. It's got to be on someone on rescue one in their own floor two. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is Susanovich. I'm stuck. Or I've fallen. Well, Susanovich, Susanovich, you looked. He's on ladder one. He was on the roof. If he's fallen, he's either in the attic or he's, he has fallen to floor three. So then you send your writ people there or anybody on floor three because they're going to be the first resources that are going to be able to get to Susanovich and uh, give him some assistance. So you tie the accountability system with your portable radio drills. On the next slide, you can see that we're using some plastic instead of a fence. This is a good alternative. This creates a, a, a sensation of being pinned. You kind of lean on the firefighter, and you can accomplish the same thing without a fence, just using some heavy-duty plastic. In the next slide, you need to hit that twice, we teach uh, firefighters to go through the various props. And we're starting to see this now. This one's an entanglement prop. But in the past, we only taught them how to self-extricate and how to do the swim profile. Calling the mate and giving that information was never part of, of the class. But we need to make it a part of that. Once they call the mate and give that information, they can self-extricate all they want. But if they spend all their time and energy and most important air trying to self-extricate without calling for help, then, then they're just cutting their rescue window uh, down and making that window survivability extremely challenging. Next slide shows um, a firefighter following the hose line. We've all done this drill, but this is a great prop. This is just a big, thick piece of 4 by 8 plywood that's hinged. Now, this one you can slam right on the firefighter. Bam! Make it loud. It's going to hit the bottle. doesn't hurt him, but it does give him a, a, a shock sensation. For sure, and if you lean on it, that firefighter can't advance. Just that piece of wood is heavy enough to prevent that firefighter from advancing on that hose line. In the next slide, you see a, a, a slide view of that, or side view, excuse me. And that firefighter's trapped; he cannot move. So teach him to call the mayday. Next slide. Once the mayday is called using lunar, then you release the firefighter, and they can advance onto the the next. Uh, entrapment prop. Then you can see in the next slide that the firefighter is following up the stairs and then he has a roof collapse. Boom. Next slide he's in the hole. And in the next slide you can see that we're having the firefighter call the mayday and give the required information in the LUNAR acronym and then you help him out of the box. So that's where we are there. Now, on the next slide, you can see the captain's going to go through the same incident. Just because you're conducting the drill doesn't mean you don't go through it yourself. You're part of that interior team. The same thing can happen to you. Not only does it uh, 
improve and challenge your personal skills, but you're showing the guys that you're not having them do something that you're not willing to do yourself. So again, it gets slapped down. Captain needs to call Mayday. He's pinned by the uh, plywood. And once he gives the lunar uh, information, he can advance. He also falls into the pit in the next slide. And that's the drill for that. The next slide shows the firefighter that is following the hose line. And then we have a series of uh, coils which is very confusing to a blindfolded firefighter. And in the past, that's been one of the drills. Can you follow the line? He's tracing the spaghetti. But the main thing is you start that drill. Once he becomes confused, he needs to call the media at that point. That needs to be incorporated into that drill. Then he can follow the spaghetti all he wants. But if he waits and waits and waits, uses up his air, trying to follow the spaghetti pile, and then he realizes he has to call for media when, when uh, his bell rings, then you've, you've totally missed the point and not using your safety equipment to give this guy the best chance of survivability. So build a mayday, calling for the mayday and the, and the components of accurate information. Use that as any of your rescue, any of your rescue drills. The next drill shows a different variation of the fence. Firefighter comes down, you slam the fence down, bam, you have a collapse. And then what you can do is you can stand on the side of the fence and it pins the firefighter to the okay. So So I ask the question, I say, how do you call for help when your hands are pinned? That firefighter can try all he wants, but there's no way that he is going to be able to reach his radio and call for help. Now, I learned this lesson as a captain late in my career. I started fighting this prop. I'm fighting the collapse. And I finally realized I can't reach my radio. I can't call for help. And I ran out of options. And I started laughing. I said, I guess I'm going to lay here and just die. There was this young firefighter that said, lay still, captain. Lay still for 30 seconds and let your pass device go on, go off. I knew that information. But... Why couldn't I process it at the time? Answer it, because it had never been brought into a, uh, a drill scenario like that. So teach them early. If they're pinned where they cannot move, they need to stay still for 30 seconds and um, fire their pass device. That might be the only thing that they can do. Now they can either stay calm or they can try and self-extricate. All right, enough of that. Let's go on to using um, two and a half hose. Now, two and a half hose is something that you can use uh, besides fighting fire. Uh, I've used it to establish a collapse zone. Next picture shows a firefighter with a shoulder load. Um, I had to set up a collapse zone one time. They gave me some fire scene tape, and I realized there was nothing to tie the tape to. It was a windy day. I couldn't find anything to establish a collapse zone with. And so I finally came up with the idea of using hose. So next slide shows the firefighter anchoring one end of the hose. The next slide shows the firefighter laying out the hose on the collapse zone. And you can see in the next slide that it's very delineated. There's no judgment call on this. The IC can have the, the uh, collapse zone established right where he wants it. And you just say the collapse zone has been established with uncharged two and a half. Nobody go beyond the collapse zone perimeter line. And you can finish those slides all the way to the fallen arch. That shows the arrow highlighting the hose establishing the collapse zone. Setting up corrals and evacuation lanes and landing zones. This is another use for two and a half. Well, we, you can see that V pattern on the football field. Um, I figured you can use hose to help corral people. And so we did this during a fire drill at one of the local schools. In the next line, you can see a, a delineation line. We had everybody stand on this side of the fire hose, all the students. Very clear instructions, very organized, because they knew exactly where to stand because the hose was marking the area. Nobody wandered beyond the fire hose. In the next slide, you can see I created a V pattern. This was simulating a 
uh, mass decon or any sort of decon for maybe a WMD event or something like that where we need to funnel people uh, in an organized manner into a collection point to treat them or decon them. So we have the uh, apex of the V, and you can go to the next few slides and you can see that the students uh, file through the V pattern, very organized, boom, boom, boom. So you see the last of the last of the students there. So that's a very effective use of fire hose. Next slide is coupling rodeos. This is a drill. You go to the next slide that is specifically teaching them how to use Siamese and Y rodeo, or excuse me, Siamese and Y connections. Because if you get the Siamese wrong, that can really jam you up. Now, a Y can be used as a Siamese or a Y, but a Siamese can only be used as a Siamese two and one. So if you go to the next slide there, I have the Siamese and the two and a half Y, and I have various couplings, including extra ones that I don't even need on the little uh, uh, curb side there. And advance to the slide with the firefighter holding up the Siamese. This particular Siamese has a double clapper. Some of them only have one clapper that swings to either side, and you'll always have water. But if you have a double clapper and you get this Siamese going one into two, your water stops right there. So the next slide shows the hydrant. I uh, have the soft suction laid out. Advance one, and you can see that there's two sections of two and a half. In the next slide, I show that you can uh, have a nozzle attached to it. But you want to set up, as shown in the next slide, that you have the female and the male ends of the hose together. So now the rule is, is they can't switch the hose. They have to make all the connections from the hydrant to the pump panel using all the couplings. You show the slide with the pump panel, and that's the end game. They have to make that connection from the hydrant to the pump panel using all their reducers and increasers. And then you go, ready, go. And so the firefighter starts making his connections to the hydrant using the hydrant coupling. This firefighter gets the Y in the next slide. He's getting the Y connected correctly. If they do the Siamese right here, the drill is it, it's over. I mean, the hydrant water will go through the hydrant, hit the Siamese, double, double clapper shuts, and that's it. They've made an error. And that's important because if they make the error in this drill, because everyone's going to laugh and they're embarrassed. They'll never make that drill again because you've imprinted such a uh, learning visual. Uh, one of your one of your uh, RPD slides, I forget what you call those learning slides that you put for experience in your mind. But once they make that error, they'll never make it again. So we'll advance. It shows a close-up of the Y. Advance to the next slide. He's making the signing connection. Uh, using the two and a half male and the double female, respectively. And now he's advancing in the next slide, shows him connecting to the soft suction. He's tightening up his connections. You can see a close up there of the two into one, which is your signees or any fire department connection on the side of a building. And then finally, he connects it to the pump panel. Now, the drill doesn't end there. Go to the next slide, and you can see I have the firefighter charging the hydrant. This is a wet drill. Water starts flowing, and that's how you know they got it right. Continue advancing. You see the firefighters taking out the kinks. It's important to teach during all these drills the kinks are not acceptable. All right, when you look at the UL and NIST studies that are coming out, fire flow and all the water you need or that you absolutely have to have can be restricted by kinks in the hose line. So if you don't teach that, that it's important, it's not just neatness or you don't want them to be sloppy, is that they're restricting gallons per minute for the end game, then they realize that having no kinks is important. So tie it to the science and the fire behavior and the water that's needed to extinguish in cool temperatures, then they won't leave the kinks in their hoseways. You go on to advance, he's opening up the Y, continue to advance, he's taking out the kinks, Advance again, another shot there, good lay, no kinks. And then you have the close-up of the 
why with the water leaking, leaky couplings, all right? Is this important to prevent? Absolutely, if you live in Minnesota in December, because now you're creating slip hazards. You're creating ice. Not a big deal in the south, very big deal in the winter in the north. So teach these skills early. Continue on. There's a sign east, and we it goes right into the pump panel, and this session ends with the firefighter being very happy. We timed them, and then the next firefighter gets a chance to beat that time, and these firefighters are out there, I kid you not, for over an hour trying to beat each other's times, which is what we uh, want to do. You want to establish that. You want to establish that uh, competitiveness. I'm going to try and see if I can log back into this real quick. Bobby, if you want to chime in on anything right now while I try and get this Yeah, I really, in. I really like that drill because, you know, what's interesting is they could lay it all out, and then if the Siamese is wrong, you know, they're going to get a chance to lay it all out again and do it right. And I think that, that, that I, love, I love the hands-on part of it. I also love when we, when we start running kinks because running kinks is something that is a, kind of a lost art. And, and oftentimes officers will go run the kinks themselves rather than having a firefighter do it. And it, it can be a, a dangerous thing to do. You can emphasize that the kinks, running kinks should not be an officer's job. That ought to be a firefighter's job. Generally, the, the doorman or the engineer will run the kinks. We've had a lot of incidents where firefighter, where officers left their crews in order to do, you know, run kinks. Not your job. So I, I love that. that. That's a great drill. I love that drill. I also like the, the teaching people how to use their appliances and and, uh, and their connections. I think that's a really good drill because you'd be amazed. Some people haven't touched a, a Siamese or a Y since recruit school. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I'm back up on online again, so I can go from here. I'm going to advance sure. the rapid intervention team drill. Okay, so we go to uh, a rack kit. There's your typical rack kit or air rescue kit, and when we do these rig drills or rapid intervention team drills or fast trucks, whatever, and you run the evolution, a lot of times you bring the equipment, you stage it, and that's the end of the drill because you set up. But what you need to teach is actually continuing on to put the face piece onto the firefighter. Um, there's two types of scenarios. I have one called the low heat scenario. This is when a firefighter could be lethargic, semi-conscious. They're able to sit up. And you can sit them up and, and apply their, the rescue face piece. But it takes practice. You need to do it with your hands, get tight seals, put it on their face. And we can either do it on a rescue dummy or do it on live firefighters. I think you're going to get really good if you actually do it on your buddies because they're going to smack you on the head if you don't do it right and if you hurt them. So this is a task. We want to be really good at putting that face piece on a down firefighter. And we don't always carry the drill to that extent. The high heat scenario is when you have to stay low and the firefighter is down on the ground. You can work from behind the firefighter or from in front of the firefighter. And maybe all you have to do is just check the regulator on his existing SCBA. If he has sufficient air and you get the mass working, maybe that's all you need, and that's faster than putting on a rack yet. The main thing about this in the high heat scenario is that uh, here the firefighter is working from the front of the firefighter, so practice the technique. Work from the front or the back and see what works best. But you need to crack the bypass before you put that face piece on the firefighter's face. If he's unconscious and has shallow breathing, you may not have the strength to actually activate the pressure demand valve. And if you just slap that face piece on him without cracking the bypass, you're going to suffocate that firefighter. So these are all teaching points that you need to remember to go over with you guys. And go ahead and do it the right way, get a tight seal, tighten up the straps. At this stage of the game, we're going to be moving this firefighter very quickly, and you don't want that coming off. All right, next drill, switching the SCBA bottle drill. So this is based on a scenario uh, with Captain Gary Morgan from the L.A. County Fire Department. And uh, he fell through a hole, and you can see his SCBA there. Obviously, this is after the captain was rescued. He survived this event. But here's how he fell and got into this lobster trap. So Captain Morgan falls to the floor, and then the back of his bottle is hit with the floor, knocks his helmet off, and knocks his face piece off. 
Okay, so what do we do? Well, maybe if all you have is a hole, which they did, you can lower a bottle to the firefighter. He's going to need air. Every firefighter that's trapped is going to run out of air. That's the number one thing they need. So lower a bottle. But have you tried uh, switching out a bottle when, when you're uh, trapped? So I call this switching the bottle out, and they have to hold their breath. So this firefighter's taking his existing SCBA off. Maybe the bell's ringing. He's loosening the cylinder band and getting it all ready to go. He's going to have to shut it off, and then he's not going to have any air, so he has to hold his breath. And for that amount of time, that firefighter has to switch the bottle, put it back in, make the connection, and open the main cylinder valve to get air again. Very difficult. So they start competing and doing this. Well, now once they do it, try it with uh, gloves on. A lot more challenging. You can also just lower an SCBA down. Just lower a complete SCBA. That's your first rack that you have. Every firefighter has one. Take it off the medic unit. They're not using theirs. But if you need a fast uh, SCBA complete pack, lower that to the firefighter, and he can do the quick connect himself. So there's lots of variations on that drill. Here we're just lowering it from another stairwell, giving the firefighter on the landing a limited space to, to do these things. Bottom line is, how are they going to get air? Aerial operator drills. These are kind of hard to do. We've all saw this video of the Houston uh, fire where this construction worker is trapped. It's on YouTube. Check it out. And I was talking to the Houston guys. Their aerial is fully extended. They're out of aerial. So there's also another point. There's a point in this video where the firefighter is rapidly flagging or waving his hand, and so I asked the question, why is the officer waving his hand so dramatically? And we'll let people answer. The answer is because there was another firefighter mid-aerial. It's like they want to help, but if you're mid-aerial, if you're not on the extended fly, that operator cannot retract or extend the aerial because you're on it and you're going to get hurt. So the only safe place on an aerial, and again, this is an extreme situation, but it already happened, is for someone to be on the flight section already extended beyond the moving points of the ladder, and then you're safe as long as you don't retract too far. But that's what that firefighter was doing. And it's interesting to see how many uh, firefighters and officers pick that up. But I asked the question, you see the firefighter leaning over. Well, how much more ladder do you need when you're out of ladder? How do you make that? If it was a little bit shorter, that firefighter may not have made it. Or he could have jumped and it may have been too far. But does this look familiar? Yes, it does. We have the exact same building right here in Seattle, Washington. So I asked that question. It's like, well, how are we going to get this guy if we're out of aerial? And I make a side note of the Mark Falkenthal fire in Baltimore County. They ran out of aerial when they had to retrieve his body on the seaside. There was no way to get him out the A side. They went to the seaside, and the aerial was too short. And they, had a, they bridged it with the stokes, but had they... Uh, if there was a bigger gap, how do you get how do you get this uh, person out of that area? I said, well, let's look at our aerial. We got a 14 foot roofer right on the side of the aerial. Let's make use of it. So I have my firefighter climb. He's bringing the ladder up the aerial, puts it in the middle. He doesn't go beyond the tipping point. And he starts to latch the ladder. We're going to gain an extra 10 feet by lashing the ladder to the fly section. So he'll tie it to the first rung and then tie it about three rungs down. Now, the roof ladder is rated. It gets tested for the 500 pounds. And the aerial ladder is rated for more than that, uh, depending on your model. But you have strong equipment at the ready. You can use a clove hitch or a round turn or two half, but all you're doing is extending the reach of your ladder to make that particular rescue that we just saw that happened in Houston. I did this drill before the Houston event. I'm glad that I'm not glad, but I'm, when it happened in Houston, it showed that the concept has uses in extreme situations. And there you can see the aerial 
uh, we gained another 10 feet. Now, once it's set, you certainly don't want to extend. You couldn't extend. You don't want to retract the aerial at all because you'll damage your aerial. But you could move it to the left, move it to the right. You can raise and lower the aerial, just an extension of the fly. And it's not for firefighters to climb on. It's just to give a little more access for that victim to climb onto the aerial. That's all you're doing. So what happens if that person is ready to jump or makes a leap before you tie off the, the uh, aerial? Well, as long as you don't go past the tipping point, you can have your firefighter lay on the aerial, maybe take a wrap, use your entire body weight, and grab the bottom rails of the aerial ladder. This is an extreme rescue, but I think that the Houston incident shows that it already happened. I know that my crew can make that rescue if we get it. Here's another aerial uh, operation for uh, drivers. This is a vertical ventilation operation. The guys are going up on the roof. That's the last time he sees them. All of a sudden, you tell your driver, kaboom, there was this major event roof collapse. Well, those guys may not show up exactly where they got off the aerial. Here they're on the different side of the building, and the aerial operator has to quickly move the aerial to where the firefighters are. And so this is a skill set to have your uh, aerial operator move the aerial quickly but safely to get to where the firefighters have showed up after the event. He can't see it. He's only seen it from the from the portion, from the downward portion. Uh, you also have to teach your aerials to climb up on a parapet wall and get on an aerial from the side. We don't always just climb off the last rung at the tip. That's the safest way, but that's not reality. So you need to create opportunities for them to get on the aerial. So now you have the roof collapse. The firefighters are on. The next objective on this drill is to have the firefighter move the aerial away from the collapse zone and lower it as quickly as possible to reduce the angle so that your firefighters are safe. They don't have to worry about holding on. They could be injured. They could be burned. And so you want to lower that angle so that they give them a platform instead of a, a high ladder to try and recuperate from. And then swing it away from the building, lowering it below the uh, roof line protects them from the thermal heat, and then moving it away protects them from the collab zone. Lowering the angle gives them a, a safe platform to recover or for, for you guys to send additional people up. Now, this person here, this collapse, supposedly the, he was on the uh, Alpha Delta. Now I have a guy on the Alpha Bravo side. So the operator has to quickly raise the aerial, clear the Alpha Delta corner, and he has to bring the aerial down to the Alpha side of the incident. Firefighter gets on. Firefighter is on the aerial, and now the driver can lower the angle. Again, this guy might be injured or burned. And that's exactly what happened here. If you look at the end of the Houston video, they lowered the angle, and the aerial operator moved the aerial away from the building right as that top floor collapsed with fire. If he didn't move, it could have landed right on top of those guys. So that's the evolution, and this event just makes it a realistic drill because it's already happened. I'm going to advance a little bit here and go to go to some hose drills real quick, and then we'll end by. Oh, I do want to go to this one here. This is something that's real relevant. Let's get this to go. Okay, you should see a self-arrest using a pipe pole or rubbish hook. Okay. I actually did this drill before, um, and then we had the incident in Fresno, which is very similar to this. So we, we're on a vertical vent, and we have these rafters. But if you go through, you see that's quite a bit of a drop right there. Um, if you teach your firefighters to use a roof hook and go perpendicular to the rafters, 
that might be all they need to arrest themselves from falling straight into a hole. Right? So this firefighter is, is sounding the roof. All of a sudden he steps on, falls through a hole, quickly turns his roof hook sideways, and at least gives him something to hold on to that maybe his partner can grab him or he can roll out of a hole. It's a hard one to stage, but it's doable. And I'm not saying that this was the solution to Fresno. I'm not saying that this would have uh, prevented the Fresno captain from going into the hole. But if you watch that video in slow motion, you can see that his, his roof hook is already at a 45. I mean, he almost would, if, if, he, if he could have felt the sensation, this, this event happens fast, but if they're prepared for any movement to turn their roof hook sideways, that might be all you need to roll out. And that's certainly better than uh, going through a fireball and going down. I'd rather be in the fireball and be on the roof where I can roll away from it. And here he's using the uh, end of the roof hook to help pull himself out of the hole. So that's kind of an interesting drill right there. Um, Bob, there's a lot more, but I think maybe we should go to some questions. Yeah, if you feel like taking a, a break from it, that was some amazing Do we have more time? Partner. We, yeah, you've got. Uh, I'd say you, I would take another. I'd take another five ten minutes, and then we've right now we've got two questions holding. But that's it, buddy. If you want to do another drill, I'd I'd love to see another drill. Okay, well then let's go to the uh, let's go to the wall drill. This one's always a fun one. Here I just have a uh, seven and a half foot retaining wall, but these are all little. Uh, techniques that we just discovered trying to create a simulation of a guy falling into a basement. So this guy here climbed Mount Everest. His name is Chris Buller. He thought he could just pull himself up, but he wasn't able to do it. And so what do you do? And so you look at the different ways, but let them figure it out. You're just posing the scenario. And they're boosting each other up, and then he gives a hand to his guy. And they realize, well, if we had the tool... Let's start using the tools. And this one we're using the Halligan tool. It gives you a boost up. Maybe that's the only tool you have. But then we looked at the D-handle pike pole, which is one of my favorite tools. We realized, well, you've got a handle here and you have a stirrup. If you put that handle on the edge of a window, the, the hook digs in and the point is a perfect handle for your hand. And the D-handle... It works better with a longer one. There's a stirrup for your boot, and maybe that's all you need. Here he's putting the halogen for his left foot. Now he switched here, right, left, and he's using the D handle as a stirrup, and he's over the wall. Then another fire said, "Well, let's try a longer D handle pike pole." So he gets in on it. They want to learn these skills. They don't want to be the guy that can't get out of the basement. And then we did the hose, and that worked. I'm going to advance a little bit more. So we're using the horseshoe, and, and we found out that if you spread your legs like this, this is the best way. If you just climb on, your, your boot tends to slide down the horseshoe. But if you can get into this position, you can boost yourself up. So spreading your legs is the key to that drill. And this is what it looks like uh, on the other side coming up here. He's getting on. Spreads his legs apart. Now he has some good footing. Here's the guys. As they boost up, they're pulling the slack from the hose and helping this guy up or they're anchoring it. And we're, we're just discovering the techniques. And then they said, well, what about uncharged toes? So we did it with uncharged toes. Again, very difficult unless you can spread your legs. If you spread your legs like that and create a little platform, then you can crawl up pretty easy with uncharged toes. Sliding the pole, getting down, worked. But climbing back up did not work. I think I'm losing my, losing my slides again. All 
Um, can you just go to the two and a half drills, and I'll end with this one. Did I, I lost control of the? Uh, I lost my control again. Yeah, I did too, buddy. Sure, uh, um, it, it's been advanced. So two and a half hose handling drill. Yes, Is that sir. where we're at? Okay. Yes, sir. So real quick, I'm going to end with this one. You got sharp bends here. Very difficult to um, handle it two and a half by yourself. In the next slide, I asked the questions: How long do you think these guys are going to last? Not very long without any tools. Here, the firefighter is looking uh, backwards, and the nozzleman is looking forward. He's concentrating on just not losing his grip, and he's really paying attention to what's going on. We have the different techniques, uh, but they're going to be quick to fatigue. So I came up with this quick technique using a body loop or a strap. You take a hose knot or a girth urge around the hose, and you do the same thing and run a pike pole through a hose knot or a girth hitch and tighten it down. So advance, advance the slide uh, to where the firefighters are side by side. It says pike pole goes underneath the hose. That's where I'm at. I'm gonna, Tell you where to go from there. So you can see the pike pole is rest against their lap on the high end of their thigh, and the hose line is resting on top of the pike pole. It's tied to the pike pole and to the hose. Now all the nozzle reaction is taken up from by the pike pole. These firefighters have no nozzle reaction. If you advance the next slide, you can see the firefighter on the right isn't even touching the hose. Now the pike pole is pushing against his right side. The Nozman firefighter on the left only has one hand on the hose just to keep it down, but his left hand is free, and we're flowing a straight stream nozzle because it's tied to the hose, and all the nozzle reaction is taken up by that cross member. So it makes it extremely easy for these firefighters to operate without becoming fatigued. And there's virtually no kickback on this nozzle. Go to the next slide. This shows the front, front view of this where you can see that the firefighters uh, are just leaning forward. They're not exerting any effort on this two and a half straight stream. They just lean into it. Let's advance two slides. Now, if you're in a high heat situation, all you simply do is flip the pipe pole over on top of the hose. You don't even have to retie this evolution. The firefighter in the back kneels down. He's straddling the hose. You can see the hose strap coming from behind his boots, and now the pike pole is resting on his lap. And the firefighter nozzleman is laying down on his right side. So let's advance two slides, and you can see now the backup firefighter, he can see, paying attention to his surroundings. He's taking all the nozzle reaction out. The firefighter laying on his, on his right side is able to operate that nozzle. He can whip it around, up, down. It's, it's incredible. It's a great evolution. You want to try this one right away because uh, you'll be very effective with two and a half. And let's go to the full size. You can you can see the uh, firefighter laying down, um, and the firefighter that is the officer position. Even though he's smiling, the point is that he's able to pay attention to the surroundings because now they're fighting fire and they're not wrestling the uh, nozzle reaction and the kickback of a two and a half hose line. All right, let's go to one-man experiments real quick. You can see the firefighter trying to play just with the with the uh, fire hose there. But what we discovered is that you can use the pike pole in this position. Next slide, it says long pike pole. The pike pole is under the left arm of the firefighter. It's still tied off, as you can see, and uh, it's butted against his right on the inside of his right foot. Now, the firefighter is simply, with a straight stream, just leaning into the pike pole. Look at his, look at his uh, posture. He's not wrestling this hose at all. The pipe pole is under his arm, and let's advance to where it says butt against your foot. The uh, pipe pole tip is digging into the dirt or even on the concrete. It doesn't slide, but it's butted up against his right foot. Next slide. With the, it says long pipe pole. You can see now the uh, pipe pole is on the inside of his arm. You can do it either way, but he's just leaning into the pipe pole. Again, it's all straight stream. 
advance the next two slides, pike pole is uh, over the arm, over the inside arm instead of under. You can go either way. Long pike poles work better than short pike poles. So let's just look at the short pike pole and we'll end with that. The short, the short pike pole is under his arm now. Advance to the next slide and you see the right side of this firefighter. Again, it's tied off the same. He's anchoring the uh, tip of the pike pole with his right foot, but he's just leaning into the hose. Again, because it's shorter, it's a little bit harder. Advance to the next slide and you can see the D-handle is under his right armpit. Now that's pushing against his body, but it's all being taken up and directed to the ground through the rigid pike pole. And the last slide there shows that uh, the body loop is secured. You're looking underneath the firefighter and you can see the uh, D handle under his left armpit and he's simply leaning into it. So anyway, um, those are just some yeah, of the many things we have come up with. Oh, go ahead, Bunny. No, no, I was going to say that was amazing. And, and I know you've got, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Raul has uh, dozens more that he can that he could go through during time limitations. We kind of pushed this as, as far as we could. We're a little over our time right now. It was fascinating. You, you flooded us with a bunch of questions right at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass these questions. Tammy's going to pass these questions along to Raul. He'll, he'll, when he gets a chance, I know he's busy because he's still on, on the floor with us all working every day. But uh, he'll he'll get you answers to these questions, and he'll post them up on fireengineering.com so you can come back and, and see them. Some of them are age-old questions, like how do you get uh, you know the old guys to, to want to drill and, and, and questions like that. And I know Raul has a bunch of great uh, solutions and a great a couple of great selections, but we kind of ran up against the time clock here with some of our uh, technical stuff, and Raul did an amazing job, as always. Uh, you know, Captain Angelo is probably one of the best presenters I've ever had the joy of listening to. That was some, some great stuff. And, and while Raul was going through some of the options for getting out of the basement, we had a couple of people chime in about you know using uh, hose straps and some other ideas, which is just great. I mean, when you when you uh, one of the things Raul is really good good at doing is helping people find solutions on their own, which are always more endearing and, and obviously more meaningful to the folks you know going through the process. So it was just an amazing presentation. Again, you'll be able to see Raul at FDIC 2016 on an expanded version, the 2016 version of, of this great class, you know, drills that you won't find in the books. It's a, an amazing uh, presentation and, and uh, it continues to amaze me. On behalf of our uh, sponsor, Target Solutions, we want to thank you. Target Solutions is one of the best sponsors we have, great friends of fire engineering and fire rescue and, and, and fire uh, apparatus and, and also FTIC. Over 2,000 organizations are currently using Target Solutions Innovative Technology. I can't tell you, there's a lot of great training on their website. So please go to www.targetsolutions.com and, and check out all the stuff they have to offer and all the solutions they have to offer to your training needs and your record keeping needs. Rule, I can't thank you enough for a great webcast. Uh, sorry for some of the technical glitches we had during the show, but as usual, you handled it like a true professional with, uh, with the grace and elegance that you bring to everything you do. So on behalf of everybody here at Fire Engineering, we want to give you a big thank you for a, a wonderful presentation. Again, this will be archived and available within 24 hours on fireengineering.com. And Raul, if you have any closing words for our audience, we'll, we'll let you close it out. No, I just want to thank you, and uh, just don't be afraid to experiment. And don't be afraid to be laughed at. I've been laughed at over the years, and uh, they're going to laugh. They're going to tease. But really, deep down, they really do want to know. Uh, they want to learn to do the job the best way they can. Um, if you do sign up for this class next year, I make this entire four-hour, 1,200-plus PowerPoint. That's a huge file. But I give every member who signs up a DVD of the entire, entire presentation so they can take it back to your station. Beautiful. Thanks You're for inviting me, Bobby. You're a scholar, my friend. We'll talk with you soon, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes our webcast. Thank you for joining us, and please be careful out there.